Welcome, shalom. I'm very excited to welcome you here to what is the first formal collaboration of CSI Hillel, Wagner College Hillel, and Wagner College Holocaust Center to bring you this important program um, to commemorate this month the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Yet, even amidst all of the ceremonies, so much remains beyond comprehension. We will hear shortly about one of the U.S. soldiers, Frank Babella, who was a liberator. But let us note, at the beginning, three years earlier, in March of 1942, before Auschwitz-Birkenau became infamous, when the first Jewish women arrived there. A recent book has captured both their experiences and the defiance. Helena Citrin, the 1,971st Jew to enter Auschwitz, stated, we were exhausted from cleaning swamps, demolishing buildings, clearing snow, carrying manure, and digging ditches. Auschwitz was like 10 plagues in one day. She was among the handful that survived three winters in the industrial-style killing factory, the death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau, where over 1.2 million died. <coughs> Wagner College Holocaust Center has been able to create a speaker's bureau where where Staten Island Holocaust survivors, such as those here tonight, Arthur Spielman, Brenda Perlman, and Shirley Gottesman, who will be speaking uh, tomorrow morning to 80 fifth graders from PS29 in our dining hall and new Holocaust exhibit. All of these survivors struggled to explain the inexplicable. How did the Holocaust happen? For Arthur Spielman, the worst thing about Nazi persecution was the fear. Rami Cohn, speaking to the House of Representatives last night, put it very simply. At age 13, I was condemned to death, and so was my little sister, my baby sister. Um, Shirley Gottesman tells about finding her mother's shoe in Auschwitz, and that that was the moment she knew that her mother had been gassed. Brenda Perlman talks about losing her baby brother Pinchas and the toll it took on her parents to lose both their child and their parents. Her husband had his father shot by the Nazis. How can we capture this horror? Let me start with two students from Wagner College and their reflections on the, when they met Rachel Roth, who spent this week in Auschwitz as a guest of the US government. Right before I took a class of students, including um, two who are here tonight, Jennifer Wiley and her father, Frank Wiley. Um, one of our students, who was not Jewish, Ellen Wrighty, um, met with Rachel Rahama Roth. She wrote this after visiting Auschwitz. Going to Auschwitz made me open up and fully realize that the victims of this tragedy were ordinary, everyday people who were put into this awful place. I still have a hard time imagining the Rachel Roth I know as being a victim in that horrible event. But yet, when I was there, I couldn't but help imagining her standing where I was standing. After we walked out of the gas chambers in Auschwitz, a student said something in words that I had been feeling the whole day. No one walks out of a gas chamber. While my experiences at Auschwitz has benefited my education more than I can put into words, it has done more than that. It has changed me as a person. Since I hope one day to be a doctor myself, I am horrified at how the German doctors that joined the SS were able to perform such vicious acts on the prisoners of Nazi camps. When doctors are supposed to be healers, how could they become murderers? I believe that through Holocaust education, this is a question she will ponder for the rest of her career and life. Similarly, I want to share a reflection of another student, Emma, um, who went to Auschwitz. She wrote, what really was powerful to me in Auschwitz was the display of pa prayer shawls that various prisoners had brought with them to the camp. They symbolized hope. Yet whether they were long-term prisoners or killed immediately upon arrival, either way, they don't get to keep these prayer shawls. This is why it's so important to have the Wagner College Holocaust Center connect our students with Holocaust survivors, with sites of remembrance, um, and with the issues raised by the Holocaust. This is why it's so important for events like tonight, where we grapple with controversial issues, 
Why did the government, the U.S. government, not admit more Jewish refugees? How many more could be saved? What was done? Our talk tonight will raise these issues and I hope will generate some interesting discussion. I want to thank the Wagner College High Society and the Holocaust Advisory Committee Boards, the CSI Hillel Board, the Wagner College and CSI faculty and staff and students who are here, and all the community members who have joined us for this talk. Um, in a few moments, I will ask each of you to light candles. Um, but first, we have a few words of welcome from our new president, um, Joel Martin, who has been committed for many decades to the cause of human rights. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Laurie. It's with a profound appreciation for the work that Laurie and our other faculty do to uh, help our students uh, grapple with the horror uh, of the Holocaust and never forget that I stand here tonight to welcome you. And I'm really glad we're all here today, together tonight. I think it's uh, most urgent that we commit ourselves to this work that our faculty are leading with such grace and perseverance. And Jan and I share in that. We're eager to support this work. We think it's most important and urgent in our time. The Holocaust is such an epic, horrible, uh, catastrophic event that affected so many millions. 1.1 at Auschwitz alone. Dozens of millions involved in the war. We've all been touched by it in different ways. Some of us personally, directly involved in it. We'll hear from them tonight, I believe. Others had family members. Others had people who served, as I did, uncles in Italy in fighting against the Nazis, uh, and in Japan as well. Um, so the, this the epic portion, uh, epic size of the event. It commands respect, it demands respect, it demands memory. Uh, the fact that we're at a moment in history where we're 75 years past the event brings to mind that it'll soon be on all of us who are younger to carry forward that memory. So again, the Holocaust Center carries that, that responsibility. We support it for that reason as well. And then our times, our times where we see injustice continue to be current and sweeping across our country and around the world. And you know, I think there's a quote in, in, in the invitation from Eli Wiesel who says, you know, we may not always be able to fight injustice, but we must always protest. And then I would dare to add to that, um, that we must always remember. And so that's the work we're trying to do here with our Holocaust Center. I'm really grateful for the collaboration with CSI, Hillel, our own Hillel, High Society, for the leadership of our faculty, and all of you for being here tonight, because seeing you here tonight gives me hope that we will always remember. We will never forget. So with that, I'll let the program proceed. Again, welcome to Wagner College. We're really glad that you're here to share in this important work, all of us as witnesses to the Holocaust. Samantha Powers is credited with coining the term upstander. She has written, quote, Every day, almost all of us find ourselves weighing whether we can or should do something to help others. We decide on issues large and small, whether, we'll be, whether we will be bystanders or upstanders. Let us, of all faiths, make an active commitment to disrupt bigotry and hate wherever they are found. What is hard to recognize, call out, and combat forces of hate before it is too late. I'd like to call up now the Stefano family. Um, who exemplify the ways of not being indifferent in the footsteps of their great uncle, um, who took such care to record and eyewitness what he saw. Um, Tonight, we reverently reflect on how our fellow brothers and sisters suffered and perished in the Holocaust. I became acutely interested and aware of the Holocaust at the age of eight, 
as, as depicted in the video, from my uncle Frank Labella, who's an Italian American who's living in the Lower East Side in Middle Italy, uh, became a soldier in General Patton's army. And if I show you all, that's my great grandmother who didn't speak a word of English. She was an immigrant from Sicily, kissing her boy goodbye. And uh, I, that might have been the last time he had that beaming smile on his face. And I, and I mean that seriously, because that's not how he was when he came back. Um, this was his last day before leaving for Europe. Uh, that little boy is that man right there in the blue shirt. That's my dad, Joe Stefano. And they're on the rooftop of Kemmer Street in Little Italy with uh, the Empire State Building in the background. So uh, my Uncle Frank was, went to basic training in California and he landed uh, in Normandy Beach July 16, 1944 with General Patton's uh, Fourth Armored Division. Uh, his unit then swept through uh, the hedgerows of France and into southeast France and made its way up north and eventually, uh, and this is all actually documented and I've given this to the Holocaust Center as well, he had typed up notes for each and every skirmish and camp and everything that he saw there uh, to, to document you know, his, his time in, in, in the service. So he also took a brownie camera, and for, for those of you who are young, too young to understand what that meant, it, it was the first digital, I mean, we have digital cameras now in our pockets, but a brownie camera was the mainstay of soldiers and people. It, it, it took photographs of celebrations, but in this case, fortunately, he had this on, on his person. Um, so in April of 1945, after having battled through Europe, uh, pushing the Germans back in, into uh, their country, he arrived in uh, Ardorf, which was a sub-camp, a labor camp of Buchenwald. And they, his unit happened to have been the, the first allied unit to liberate a concentration camp. Uh, and I did not know that at the age of eight. I, I didn't know these details until the last few years, but thanks to Google and other sources. So it was the first camp liberated by the Allies, and it confirmed the rumors that the Nazis were systematically killing and enslaving Jews and others. And my dad, again, was here tonight, told my uncle it was important that I learn about the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis. Now, it may have seemed a bit graphic uh, to show an eight-year-old these photographs, but in retrospect, what it did was it lit the fuse to drive me personally to always keep the memory of those who perished in the Holocaust alive. Um, on the back of one photo, and again, as shown in the video, in his own handwriting, he said, I'll never forget this place. As a matter of fact, I believe we should all teach our children and their children about this epic human tragedy and horror. And I believe I've done my share by teaching my sons, and I hope that you'll all do the same. Thank you. And I'm an 8th grader at Our Lady Queen of Peace School. I've been fortunate enough to meet Rabbi Rami Cohen, a hero to mankind who fought the Nazis at the age of 14, and who now speaks about his experience during the Holocaust. I also met a great uncle, Frank Labella, who as a soldier of General Patton, helped to liberate a Nazi concentration camp named Odra. Both of these heroes inspired me to use a social networking system by the name of Google Classroom that educates my fellow students on Holocaust. I prepared my survey for my class. Oh, sorry. I prepared a survey for my classmates that questions their knowledge on Holocaust. Some examples of questions include: How many people died in the Holocaust? Who were the Nazis? 
And can you name any concentration camps? One day, I asked my father if I could purchase artifacts from the Holocaust with my confirmation money. He and I went online to auctions and purchased these artifacts. They may include letters from Dachau, Mathenhausen, and two identification tags from stars of David from Lodz in Poland. I'm donating these items so other people will never forget the horrors of the Holocaust. May peace be with you all, and shalom. Representing Governor Andrew Cuomo, and will speak about uh, Governor Cuomo's recent visit to Auschwitz. Um, also, Councilman Borelli went to Auschwitz this week, um, as well as Rachel Roth. So, Staten Island was well represented, um, and those representing Staten Island um, expressed their commitment to commemorate. Thank you. Hi everyone, I just want to thank you for having me. Uh, Lori invited the governor and I'm here representing him as a Staten Island Regional Representative. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about his visit to Auschwitz this past week. Um, so he went with a few senior staff members. Uh, he left on Sunday and stayed for a few days. Um, and it was very important to him considering, you know, the uptick in hate crimes and what the Jewish people have gone through and what they're still going through today. Um, and for him, it was a pow powerful reminder of that. Um, so he got back a few days ago, and actually today we had a conference on safety and security grants, which uh, he put aside $45 million um, in order to purchase security measures for religious institutions um, across the state. Um, and in addition to that, he is proposing, um, like our wonderful speaker just said, uh, civics about the Holocaust, because um, we can't forget something so tragic. Um, and again, I want to thank you for hosting this, um, and I look forward to events in the future. Uh, thank you. And now I'm going to call upon my colleague. Um, oh no! First, before we, we do the candle lighting. Okay. Now we're going to do a brief um, candle lighting ceremony. Um, we're going to ask six groups to stand, and of those, two will be lighting candles. Um, the three students who are helping can please come up and take the candles from Linda. Um, so the students. These are um, Elizabeth Polykov representing Wagner Hillel. Um, Anthony Rubin representing CSI Hillel, and Shaked Yakabi um, representing uh, the Wagner College Holocaust Center Internship Program. We have another intern, Emma Luxemburg, um, at the back of the room. And the three of them will be responsible for handing out the candles. The first group I'd like to call up are the Holocaust survivors first generation. Um, that's Brenda Perlman, Arthur Spielman, and Hanoch Dubitsky. And is there any other first generation survivors um, to please light the candles? <coughs> so everyone's just going to be lighting. The just the, the everyone to get, so you should hand. Candles. Yeah, and hand, so, yeah, there's two candles. So you, but between, are the few candles going to go over for a second? Mm -hmm. Can you, the three of you light again, just symbolically, all, they can just all come over, and all three together light it at the same time. Yeah, now just to re relight it. Yeah, just to, yeah, yeah like that. Re relight it, that's Thank you. Got it, Rita? Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now, if you could hand Thank the candles you. back to the students and the second generation Holocaust survivors who would like to light, if you would please come up. All the second generation. <laughs> Okay, so everyone come around this way. Come around this way. I want to get a picture with you. Yeah, we also want to get a picture. Don't start a fire. Okay. See, everybody look at Rita. And if I could then get the third generation Holocaust survivors to light a candle. Anybody else in third generation light a light a candle? Please come do so. Third generation, where's Jennifer? Thank you. Very Thanks, specific. Dan. Let's get Jennifer. Okay, and if I could have the De Stefano family to light the fourth candle, um, along with the president and first lady of Wagner College. Just all one candle. All one candle symbolically? Let's do it together. Do it together, yeah, that'll be best. Perfect. And then if you could look at Rita for a second. Make sure. Make sure. Oh, sorry. Hi, over here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then if the fifth candle from CSI, any of the board members, and Amy, and Shifra. Shifra, we need you. Thank you. Judge Phil. Anybody, anybody the CSI board? board here? Like the CSI board, board, and then also Anthony, why don't you light with them? Okay, I'll light with them. Um, Shippers outside, can you just grab her? Can you just grab her? Can you just grab her? I'll be lighting with CSI, then I'm going to light with CSI. That's CSI. <clears throat> You're next. Sorry. Wait, did you change it? Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi, I'm over here. <laughs> yeah. And Rita is a professional photographer who went with us to Auschwitz, so she took a lot of excellent pictures in Auschwitz. Thank you. And the final candle for the Wagner College uh, faculty, the High Board, and the Holocaust Advisory Board, if you could come up um, and light the final candle. Um, as well as any Wagner College students who haven't lit yet, Emma. Um, that would be Nancy and you and Linda and Ruth if they want to come up and get Fran. Any of you want to come up again and like. And Ruta. And if you want to come up again. And alumni, sure. Alumni of Wagner. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Weintraub. Mm -hmm. All the Wagner people. Oh, right? all we the got CSI, then we got the Wagner. I went to watch which yeah, is 70 set. So, yeah. Did you want the advisory? Yeah, and I'll go in the picture too. Yeah, please. <laughs> oh, but Rita, you should be in this picture. I can't be. Should I take the picture? Yeah, 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 yeah just take, let him take the picture. Rita, come in the picture. Okay, here we go, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And so with six candles, we commemorate the six million who perished, as well as the rescuers and resistors of all faiths um, who came to their aid, which leads us directly into tonight's topic. 
And so I'm going to call my um, treasured colleague, Amy Posner, to speak for a few minutes and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you to Lori. As, as she said, this is actually, we have done many uh, joint programs together for our students. But this is the first time that we're doing uh, this kind of event as a joint endeavor. Hillel at the College of Staten Island for the last several years has been running a very successful and enjoyable and intellectual book and author event series thanks to um, some of our board members who underwrite the events. The book and author series allows us to, so, to support Shabbat programs, Sabbath programs for our Hillel students at the College of Staten Island. Um, <clears throat> And normally, we charge for those events. We did not charge for tonight, as you all notice. But on your seats, there's an envelope from Wagner College's development office. And we are asking that if you can make a contribution, um, the proceeds will go actually to help underwrite tonight's event, um, which we would greatly appreciate, because both of us run our programming on a shoestring. And as an added incentive, if you um, make a contribution tonight, we have your envelope. At the end of the night, we'll take one of those and whoever's envelope it is will get two free tickets to our next book and author event at College of Staten Island on March 15th, which is um, former Congressman Steve Israel. He's going to be talking about his book called Big Guns, which is a uh, satirical novel about the gun lobby. And it should be also a wonderful, um, fun, and interesting event <clears throat> to be at. So I hope you all will consider giving. Um, I want to thank uh, President Martin, and I want to thank all of the uh, Wagner College Holocaust Center volunteers, and I want to thank the board of Hillel at the College of Staten Island, who you saw uh, come up, because they are all our partners in helping to create Jewish community on the college campuses here on Staten Island. In fact, Hillel's mission at College of Staten Island and here at Wagner is to create warm and welcoming Jewish community that nurtures Jewish identity, that builds bridges of understanding between different peoples on campus, and helps to create um, a, uh, a, an environment on campus that is um, open and understanding of all different kinds of people. So um, we thank you for being here tonight. And um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Erbelding. And I told you that um, Hillel at CSI runs these book and author events. They really are, I have to give credit where credit is due, they really are thanks to Susan and Jack Bender, who um, initiated this program. And our Hillel belongs to the Jewish Book Council, thanks to Susan and Jack. And the Jewish Book Council then affords us uh, access to many different authors on many different topics that we can then bring um, as speakers. And so it's my great pleasure, Susan and I and our committee every year, we go over the authors and we decide who to bring. And uh, this year, Lori and I talked about who to invite for this event. So it's my great pleasure to invite, uh, to welcome Dr. Rebecca Erbelding. And she is a historian of American responses to the Holocaust and the author of the book she's going to be speaking about tonight, An Authoritative History of the War Refugee Board, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe, which is available for sale. And uh, Dr. Rebelli will be happy to sign your copy after the program. This book is the winner of the 2018 National Jewish Book Award for writing based on archival material. That's quite prestigious, by the way. She's a historian, archivist, and a curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So she came up here today from DC to be with us. And she's presented on US immigration policy during the 1930s. That includes Holocaust era diaries, Anne Frank and the Hucker album, a photograph album owned by Carl Hucker. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. <laughs> the final adjuncting to the commandant of Auschwitz Birkenau. I earned a, she earned, she, I'm reading her thing. She earned a PhD, <laughs> and I don't have a PhD. 
She earned a PhD in American history at George Mason University, and her research focused on ways in which communities deal with historical incidents of widespread and unexpected destruction, violence, and death. She's interested in the ways in which people acting without the hindsight of history react to outbreaks of such kinds and try to protect themselves and their loved ones and what pieces of their lives they fight to retain and rebuild. And though most of her work focuses on the Holocaust, which is the ultimate example of that kind of upheaval, she's also interested in epidemic disease, criminal activity, and natural disasters. She's, um, <clears throat> she presents frequently on the War Refugee Board and the wide range of American responses to the Holocaust and other Holocaust-related issues. And despite all this, she claims to be a very happy person, which I think is wonderful <laughs> to maintain optimism in times of such darkness. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Erbelli. Every time I hear my bio read out loud, I think I should shorten it, mm -hmm. so I apologize. Um, I'm, I'm going to hold the microphone because I want to make sure that as I turn and, and kind of point at things that you can continuously hear me. Um, I think it's really fitting that, that we started tonight with a commemoration of liberation because liberation is the ultimate American and allied effort to save the Jews of Europe. The United States, don't get me wrong, did not go to war to save Jews. It did not go to war to rescue Jews. It did not go to war for any reasons that have anything to do with the Holocaust. But the thing that stopped the Holocaust was the defeat of Nazi Germany, was the liberation of the concentration camps and allied victory over Nazi Germany. Um, and the, the efforts made by American soldiers, there were 16 million Americans, more than a tenth of the US population, served in uniform during World War II, and more than 416,000 American soldiers died in the war. Um, 50,000 just in Europe in three months in, 19, in the summer of 1944, um, as Frank was coming up as part of the, the Fourth Army. And so honoring their efforts, I think, it is a really fitting way um, to include in a um, Holocaust commemoration. So my book, Rescue Board, um, really begins the first full weekend of 1942 in the Les Miles internment camp in southern France. Um, this is Roswell McClelland on the right. He and his wife Marjorie um, are in southern France as aid workers for the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. Um, the Quakers had a really interesting relationship with Nazi Germany because they were pacifists. And because so many American relief organizations, particularly the Quakers, did a massive amount of relief after World War I. Germany is devastated after World War I, and so the Quakers are in Germany doing feeding programs, feeding millions of German children every year. And so the Nazis remembered many of them being fed by the Quakers as children. And so they allowed the American Quakers much more leeway to continue to distribute relief in Europe, even after Pearl Harbor and the US joined the war. So you have a situation in 1942 where you have a Quaker aid worker in Les Mille, which is a camp in southern France, and he's watching the first wave of deportations of foreign Jews from Les Mille north to Drancy, which is a camp outside of Paris, and from there they'll be sent to Auschwitz, where almost all of them will be killed on arrival. And Ross McClelland, our Quaker aid worker, knows what is about to happen to these people. Um, a, about a week earlier, he had managed to get a meeting with Pierre Laval, who was the head of Nazi collaborating Vichy France, the southern part of France that wasn't occupied by Germany. And he had told Laval that Laval needed to stop these deportations, that France could not let this go forward, that he needed to tell the Germans that the Nazis planned to exterminate these people. And that's the words he uses in his notes in 1942. And Laval had laughed at him. He said, it, it's a fiction, it's a rumor. The Nazis promised that these are um, special ethnic reservations in Poland where people will be well cared for. And anyway, Laval tells McClelland, if the United States, if your country cares so much about the fate of the Jews, why haven't you taken them? So Rescue Board then goes back and says, well, okay, how did we got to there? Or how did we get to there? And, you know, we get to there because in the 1920s, 
We have new immigration laws that are specifically based in eugenic and racist science. The idea that some people are better biologically than other people, um, and that where you are born dictates what kind of person you're going to become. So there are countries that produce criminals and countries that produce good, upstanding immigrants. And our immigration law is based in that idea. So from the 1920s until the mid-1960s, we actually have laws in place that limit the number of immigrants from each country, giving far greater um, ability to come to people from Germany or from Great Britain, places where the good immigrants are, and far fewer slots for people from Southern and Eastern Europe where Slavs and Catholics and Jews in particular live. So these immigration laws are structured since the 1920s and there's really no appetite in the United States in the 1930s to change them even as more and more information starts coming out about Nazi persecution of German Jews. This is not secret in the United States. Often when I, when I talk to groups, they think that the United States knew nothing about what was happening to Jews until it was too late. This is not true. In the spring of 1933, within six weeks of Hitler being appointed Chancellor of Germany, Americans very much know it is headline news even as Roosevelt is being inaugurated, even as the New Deal is beginning, even as Prohibition is ending, often the headline is what's happening to the Jews in Germany. Jews being kicked out of the civil service, books being burned, Jewish stores being boycotted. Um, this is a petition from March 25th, 1933. So this is three weeks into the Roosevelt administration, less than two months since Adolf Hitler has taken power. And the taxicab industry of the city of New York is writing to the U.S. government to protest. They are among the 500 plus organizations from all over the United States who write to the State Department or write to the government and send some sort of petition saying, we think you should do something about this. Reports have reached us that there exists in Germany a spirit of religious bigotry and racial hatred which has led to attacks and outrages on the Jews of that country, resulting in death and that the German government has taken no steps to safeguard the lives and property of Jews. They are threatening to return to the anti-Semitic spirit of the Middle Ages, and we, the representatives of the taxicab industry of the city of New York, look to you in the name of humanity and religious freedom and human brotherhood to try to do something to stop this. They call it terrorism. But, as with most things, um, foreign things especially, Americans don't have a long attention span. And this slips off the front pages. Americans are experiencing 25% of our workforce is unemployed in the summer of 1933. And Americans, though they're protesting for a few months, they stop paying attention. They pay attention again with Kristallnacht, with the attacks on Jews in November 1938, which again is headline news throughout the country. This is the New York Daily News for November 11th. Nazi mobs burn and loot. This is the next day. Jews rushed to camps. But this doesn't result in any sort of sustained effort to try to help them. Hundreds of thousands of Jews are trying to get to the United States, desperately. We make no effort to change our immigration laws. There's no asylum. We don't have anything like asylum in our immigration or in our, our government structure. You can't come as a refugee. That is a meaningless term in US law. And so you have all of these hundreds of thousands of people that we would classify as refugees and we're trying to treat them like they're immigrants and have them come through this very slow and deliberate immigration process that is not set up for a kind of emergency like this. And there's enough anti-Semitism and anti-immigration sentiment in the U.S. that even before Kristallnacht, a group of Jewish congressmen got together in the spring of April, or I'm sorry, April 1938, and they vowed amongst themselves that none of them are going to introduce any new immigration legislation. That the issue is so toxic among the American people that if they raise the debate, it will only result in a lowering of the, of the number of people who can come. There's no, um, nobody thinks that the American people are willing to raise it. Um, and this, this plays out, you see this again after Kristallnacht, there are two polls done by Gallup in November 1938, right after the attacks, and you can see that 94% of Americans disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany, but then when they're asked, same group of people, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the US to live, 72% of them say no. So it's this, it's this gap between disapproval and the willingness to be part of the solution. 
that, that goes over this entire period. But as I said, hundreds of thousands of people are still trying to make it to the United States. Even after Pearl Harbor, there are still Jews in southern France, in Casablanca, in Lisbon, who are desperately trying to get out. And so the story becomes one of trying to figure out why were there still American aid workers working in concentration camps? What did they know? And how did the US then start to deal with this crisis? Um, too little and too late, but this crisis. But mainly, the, the story that I'm going to tell you is about what happens next. Because Roswell McClelland is not the only person working that first full weekend of August 1942. Um, Gerhard Rigner, who was the representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, has just learned third hand, he's in Switzerland, um, from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan. That all of these deportations that people are hearing about, all of these um, towns that are being wiped out in the east, it's all part of a plan to round up and murder all of the Jews of Europe. This seems really obvious to us now because we know the end of the story. We, we see what Frank, De, um, Frank, it's not De Stefano, I'm sorry, Labella. Frank Labella is your great uncle. Sorry, Joe? Labella? Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, we see just now what he saw at Wardorf, and that's kind of the, what we in it, or what we imagine in our, in our brains. But for people living through that time, they've not seen this. They don't have images of concentration camps in their heads. And the idea for them that the Nazis are going to divert resources from a war that they're trying to win to murder innocent people did not seem logical to most Americans. They think it's a war rumor. They think it's just propaganda. Um, they think it's, it's the Soviets and the Polish government in exile trying to drum up support for the war by talking about how the enemy is killing women and children. And so it takes a really uncomfortably long time for the American people to understand that this is what's happening. And this is the beginning of it. Rigner gets this information. He writes a report um, to Stephen Wise, the most famous rabbi in America. And he thinks he's the head, Wise is the head of Rigner's organization. Wise knows President Roosevelt. He figures if Wise knows what is going to happen, um, if I tell him, he will go to the president, and between the two of them, they will know what to do. And you can see that the message he sends is very frank, um, but, but very alarming. Alarming report in Fuhrer's headquarters, plan discussed and under consideration all Jews in countries occupied or controlled by Germany, number three and a half to four million, should after deportation and concentration in the East, at one blow, exterminated to resolve once and for all Jewish question in Europe. So, Stephen, so Gerhard Rigner sends this message through the State Department for delivery to Stephen Wise, and the State Department refuses to deliver it. They say it's just a war rumor, it's too fantastical to be true, and anyway, one of them says, even if it's true, there's nothing the United States can do about it. But this kind of information can't be kept secret for long. It's true, and it gets out anyway. And by the end of November 1942, um, Wise has confirmed it to the press, um, and that month, though, November 1942, is the same month that the Allies land in North Africa. They are thousands of miles away from the killing centers where most people are being murdered. So the United States, the Soviets, the British, and other nations in exile decide there's nothing we can do about this except to win the war. And so they issue a statement, they condemn the policy of cold-blooded extermination, and they promised that after the war, we're going to have war crimes trials. We're not going to try to attempt any sort of separate rescue, but we will have war crimes trials after the war. We will punish the perpetrators. And as time passes, as 1943 passes, more and more information is coming out. It's now been confirmed by the US government that it's happening. And there's more and more pressure put on the government by the American people to do something about it. There are marches and rallies in cities across the country with people, activists, pressuring their local leaders to do something. They're not quite sure what, but something to try to help Jews and other Nazi victims. There's an Orthodox rabbi's march on Washington in October 1943, where about 400 Orthodox rabbis march on the US Capitol, demanding some sort of rescue response. At this point, mass, re mass rescue is impossible. There's no, we are thousands of miles away from the killing centers. There's no mechanism in which we can go in and scoop up Jews that are imprisoned in Nazi-occupied Poland. But this is a lost year. 
This is a year in which the United States understands that the Holocaust is happening and does not try to do anything to disrupt it. At this point in the story, um, a group of Treasury Department lawyers enter the picture, very unlikely heroes. Um, they have spent the fall of 1943, uh, as all of this is going on, getting um, increasingly concerned about the State Department. The State Department, which has been delaying humanitarian aid to Europe. And the Treasury Department is trying to figure out why. The Treasury Department controls economic sanctions over Europe and is willing to let humanitarian aid go through. Why isn't the State Department? So one Treasury Department lawyer in December 1943 sneaks into the State Department file room on a Saturday morning and discovers that not only has the State Department been deliberately delaying uh, humanitarian aid, but that the Assistant Secretary of State, Breckenridge Long, uh, had personally instructed U.S. diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That that information was trickling out to the activists, and if the activists don't know what's happening, they won't put pressure on the U.S. government to do anything about it. So one of the best things about studying the Treasury Department during this time is that Henry Morgan Dow Jr. is FDR's Treasury Secretary. He um, was from Fishkill, right near Hyde Park. They had known each other for years, um, he and the president. He's not an economist by any stretch of the imagination, um, but Morgenthau is a really good manager, and he trusts his people, and he's also a fantastic record keeper. Um, you can go online now, and you can read um, transcripts of almost all of his phone calls and almost all of his meetings for the 11 years in which he's Treasury Secretary. Every piece of paper that crosses his desk, he kept. Um, and so, at the end of 1943, there's a meeting in his office about this, and Josiah Du Bois, who is the lawyer who snuck into the Treasury Department, or the State Department, says at this meeting, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue, and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who is the Treasury Department's general counsel, says, we're speaking as citizens now. And I always found that incredibly powerful, this idea that they're not coming to their boss with a policy proposal. They're not coming because they think it's, it's going to play well with the American people. They're coming because they are citizens in a democracy. And they think that their country is better than what the State Department is doing. And so armed with the evidence that they've collected, they go to the president on January 16th. Well, they, they prepare a memo um, detailing everything that they've done. The original title of this memo is Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. And it begins, one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. Unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I am certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German-controlled Europe, and that this government will have to share for all time responsibility. And so they decide to go to Roosevelt. On January 16, 1944, Morgenthau and two members of his staff meet with the president, and they convince him to issue an executive order establishing a war refugee board, a new government agency tasked with carrying out a new U.S. policy of rescue and relief of Jews and other persecuted minorities. They can do anything they want as long as they do not interfere with the war effort. They cannot do anything that supposedly will delay the war. That is their only impediment. It's officially headed by the secretaries of war, state, and treasury, but it is almost entirely a Treasury Department operation. It is housed at the Treasury Department. Treasury Department officials are the leaders of this organization, um, including the new director, 35-year-old John Paley, who was born in Omaha, um, went to Yale, and ended up at the Treasury Department, um, specifically because he wanted to work on the New Deal. And he um, moves over to head the new War Refugee Board having been in charge of U.S. economic sanctions and controlling um, the equivalent of $132 billion worth of um, controlled Nazi goods. So it is a very real job that he is leaving to take the very real job of trying to rescue Jews in the final year of the war. Um, and by the time the war ends, 17 months later, the war refugee work has saved tens of thousands of lives. 
So at this point, um, most people, if I'm having a conversation with, with them, will say, how can this be true? I've never heard of this. And the, the, one of the reasons is that um, my book is the first one about them, um, which I always thought was funny because there are thousands of books that come out about the Holocaust every year and hundreds about the United States and Roosevelt. And so I just kind of assumed that someone would write faster than I do. But I think part of the reason is that a lot of the scholarship on American response to the Holocaust was done in the 1970s and 1980s. And you can see the arguments that these authors are making just from the titles of the books. The failure to rescue while six million died. The most famous is The Abandonment of the Jews, David Wyman's seminal 1984 book, which is an amazing book, but it was 1984, it was, it was 36 years ago at this point. And a lot of these books argue this story of a, a, an unbroken narrative arc of American anti-Semitism and indifference. The United States knew nothing and did nothing, or it knew everything and did nothing, um, but either way they would have been too anti-Semitic and indifferent to do anything had they known. Um, and often these books, including The Abandonment of the Jews, have a section at the end that's, oh, but there was this war refugee board, but it was too little and too late. And Wyman says it was too little, too late, and it saved 200,000 lives. And that was what piqued my interest initially, because that's, that's a disparity. Uh, too, it's too little and too late, but it also saved 200,000 people, Wyman says. Um, that is kind of incredible, and so I really wanted to look into who these people were, and what they did, and what they knew, and how they made the decisions that they did. And then as soon as I dug into it a little bit, I, I realized why, the other reason, why nobody had really done anything about this, and it's because of the records of the board itself. Um, they are up at the FDR Library in Hyde Park. There's about 120 boxes of written material um, in two main series, a correspondence series and a projects and documents series. Um, both about 60 boxes. It is basically in the order that the secretary decided that day in 1944 when she went to file it. So if there was a letter about me coming to Wagner College to give a talk for the, the anniversary, um, it could be under Wagner College in the correspondence series, W for Wagner, it could be under E for my last name in the correspondence series, it could be under the projects and documents series of like collaboration between uh, CSI and Wagner. It could be really anywhere in 120 boxes. It's whatever the secretary just decided that day. So the few historians who have written about this had just taken a few boxes from the project series and then used it to kind of summarize the whole story and not really gotten into the rest of it. And when you do that, when you just summarize this little bit of the story by looking at the folders marked Turkey and not in everything, um, you only get that tiny part of the story, whatever they decided that day. And you also lose chronology. You're telling the story of Turkey, not the story of 1944. Chronology is incredibly important when you're looking at stuff like this because it matters when you're talking about rescue whether the Nazis have invaded Hungary or not. It matters whether we've landed on D-Day or not as to the type of rescue that you can do, as to the prisoners that you have access to, as to the leverage that you have over the Nazis who are now certain to lose. And so I realized very early on that I was going to have to photograph all 120 boxes and put it in order, that I was not going to be able to look at it this way. So I spent two years photographing the entirety of the War Refugee Board collection and a few hundred dozens of other collections, hundreds of documents from the Treasury Department records and the State Department records and personal collections from families whose loved ones worked for the board. And I assigned each document, which I printed into a PDF from, from the images that I took with my camera, with an elaborate title. So this one is 440621 WRD ROE F11 D179, which that title on a PDF means that it's a document that was created on 1944, June the 21st, and that I found it in War Refugee Board Reel 8, Folder 11, the 179th document on the reel. And when you do this with, with what turned out to be 43,000 PDFs, and you put them all in one folder and you hold your breath, they sort chronologically. So no matter what collection I got it from, where in the country, it's sorted chronologically from the time that it was created. 
So then I could go through and read in the order that the War Refugee Board received documents, in the order that they wrote them, what information they had and when, how are they making decisions and why. Um, I can, this is the, this is a piece of my database, but I can see the image of the document, I can put in a title and a key and the author, I can put in keywords, and I can take notes, all of which is searchable. Um, and so I, I really could answer some really definitive questions that historians have had for a long time that was just hidden in a document in a folder that you wouldn't have looked at. Um, but when you put it all in order, you realize um, that the secretaries were actually hiding things and not meaning to. So let's talk a, a little bit about what the War Refugee Board was and did. How, how did they do these things? Um, the very first thing that the War Refugee Board does, actually the day that they're created, um, is they streamline the process that refugee aid organizations like the JDC, like HIAS, um, could use to send humanitarian aid to Europe. They first decided that if some of that aid falls into the hands of the Nazis, it's not a big deal. We're, gonna, we're still going to win the war. If some of it gets to people who need it, that's what we want. So by the end of the war, um, they've authorized the equivalent today of $154 million in humanitarian aid from a whole host of different aid groups. Um, and this goes to buy guns for the French underground. It, it goes to buy food for children in hiding. It's used to, um, to create false papers so that Jews can live as Christians or as allied citizens, um, and to pay off border guards who are um, helping people escape from Nazi territory into areas of safety. The board um, appoints representatives in most of the neutral countries in Europe, in, in Switzerland, in Portugal, in Sweden, in Turkey. They have somebody in London. They eventually have somebody in North Africa. And those people are there basically to put pressure on the neutral governments. The neutral countries, like Switzerland, have been playing at both sides for the entire war, trading with the Nazis, also trading with us. And now it's become clear that the Allies are going to win. And so the Americans start putting pressure on these governments to do more to help us, to protest what the Nazis are doing, to allow more Jews over their borders, um, to pass on intelligence about what they're seeing inside Nazi territory to help the War Refugee Board. So from Washington, John Paley, who's on the right here, lays out his strategy. He and the board are going to try to convince the Nazis and their collaborators to stop the killing. And then they're going to try to rescue the people who, can, who are still alive. They're either going to move people on the margins of Nazi territory, places like Romania, Bulgaria, and France, into areas of safety or for people deep inside Nazi territory, in Poland, in Hungary, in Germany, they're gonna to try to keep them alive as long as possible, alive long enough to be liberated. So I will give you a quick example of each one. The first thing that the War Refugee Board does is it, it um, issues warnings to the Nazis and their collaborators. Um, the very first propaganda campaign they have uh, sends radio broadcasts into Nazi territory, they drop leaflets from Allied airplanes, and in March 1944, they actually get Roosevelt to issue one of the statements in his words. They write it, of course, but it's in his words. Um, and it is pretty, um, pretty stark. In one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the day of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. So March 1944 is, is really a pivotal point in the history of the Holocaust because the Nazis have just invaded Hungary. They invaded about a week before um, Roosevelt's statement. And Hungary was the largest and last mostly intact Jewish population in Europe. There are about 800,000 Hungarian Jews, or Jews in Hungary, 600,000 Hungarian Jews, 200,000 Jews who had escaped to safety, what they thought was safety in Hungary. And so when the Nazis cross the border in March and immediately begin um, rounding up Hungarian Jews, the War Refugee Board panics and really starts trying to focus on trying to rescue the Jews of Hungary. They add a paragraph to Roosevelt's statement. As a result of the events of the last few days, hundreds of thousands of Jews who, while living under persecution, have at least found a haven from death in Hungary are now threatened with annihilation that these innocent people who have already survived a decade of Hitler's fury should perish on the very eve of triumph would be a major tragedy. I mean, it's basically aimed at would-be Hungarian perpetrators, saying you haven't been a war criminal yet. 
Why would you start now? Um, it's really hard to measure the effects of psychological warfare. You can't say um, these people survived because this atrocity was prevented. But this is a copy of the statement as it came out from Roosevelt. This was dropped from an Allied airplane um, over Germany and Hungary in the spring of 1944. And, and I found this because I was interviewing an elderly uh, German man who remembers receiving it. He found it in a potato field in April 1944. And Allied propaganda was really smart. So you see Roosevelt's um, statement on one side. On the other side would be um, reports of local bombing raids. So the Allies would say, we just hit this factory in the town near yours. And so you on the ground know that's true because you witnessed the aftermath of it. And so the guy that I interviewed said, that's how I learned about the Holocaust, is I knew that the, this, the rest of it was true. And so I assumed that this was true as well. The US government, um, through the War Refugee Board, also laundered money to help refugees sneak into Sweden. Um, I've, I've given versions of this talk, or of a talk at the Treasury Department a couple of times now. They love this story, of course, because they are the heroes of this story. Um, and the last time that I did it, it was, a, it was a public lecture, and they asked me if just for this time could I not call it money laundering. <laughs> and, and I said, well, it was, and they said, yes, yes, we know, but we don't want the headline, um, can you call it secret money transfers? And so I agreed to call it secret money transfers, which to me means the same thing, but I guess um, to the Treasury Department, they like that headline better. Anyway, this is Ivor Olson. Um, Ivor Olson is the Treasury Department financial attache attached to the Stockholm legation, which sounds like a very boring job, except that he's an OSS spy. Um, precursor to the CIA, he is codenamed Crispin and is in charge of monitoring the movement of money and war material between Sweden and Nazi Germany. So when he takes on the job as the War Refugee Board's representative, it's actually his third full-time job. He has his cover job, his spy job, and now his humanitarian aid job. And among other things, he is the guy who selects Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman who goes to Hungary in the summer of 1944 to try to rescue Hungarian Jews. Remember how I said that the US was putting pressure on neutral countries to do more? One of the things that they do after the Nazis invade Hungary is they go to all of these neutral countries and they ask them if they will increase their diplomatic representation in Hungary, send more people there, spread them throughout the country to either act as deterrents to violence or as witnesses to what's happening. Um, and only Sweden says yes for a variety of reasons. Only Sweden says yes, and Sweden says, who do you want to send? And the War Refugee Board picks Raoul Wallenberg, who works in the same office building as Ivor Olsen. That's not the money laundering story. Um, so for much of the summer of 1944, Olsen is focused on trying to get refugees out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia by water. He needs $50,000 to buy speedboats and guns. Um, which he will then give to partisan groups, to underground groups operating out of Sweden, um, who have bases on the islands off the coast of Sweden, and want to use these speedboats and guns to land on the beaches in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia and bring people back. So he says that he will need the most skillfully organized type of underground operations, because the Baltic countries are sealed to everything, but if he can get $50,000, they think, these underground groups think they can get six or 700 people out of each country. The War Refugee Board pays for this directly out of funds from President Roosevelt, but they're very nervous about the Swedish government finding out that we are funding unregulated refugee entry into a friendly nation. Um, and Olsen reports that Swedish Jews don't want to know either, that Swedish Jews are very, this is a quote, let me find it, very interested in Jewish rescue and relief operations as long as they don't involve bringing refugees to Sweden. So they need to sneak the money in. Um, John Paley in Washington contacts the staff at Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio, and asks if the U.S. government puts $50,000 on the books of their factory in Akron, will their factory in Norrköping, Sweden, remit $50,000 worth of Swedish kroner to their man, Ivor Olsen, which is how they do it. Um, there's no record of this in any of the 120 boxes that I looked at of the War Refugee Board records. They scrubbed into them. Uh, there's a record on the financial ledger and nothing else. But um, among other things that Henry Morgenthau kept, along with all of the transcripts of his meetings, 
he had folders of their incoming and outgoing correspondence and they forgot to scrub his records. Um, so this is from 1944, um, from June. This arrangement worked well and although not foolproof, it's desirable from a security point of view. At this time, we don't recommend bank transfers as receipt of cable transfers of such size by individuals involved in operations unavoidably attract notice and suspicion. So he divvies up the $50,000 among three partisan groups. Um, they buy their speedboats and their guns and they get 4,000 people out of Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. Um, most of them probably escaping the Soviets as well as escaping the Nazis. Very few of them, if any, Jewish. In Switzerland, the war refugee war needs to find somebody who's already there. Switzerland is entirely surrounded by enemy territory, so when they need an American representative, they need to find someone who's already in the country. Um, in the fall of 1942, after watching the deportations from southern France, Roswell McClellan slipped over the border with his um, pregnant wife, planning to wait out the war in neutral Switzerland as a Quaker aid worker. And so he is in place when the war refugee board needs an American and be, gets recruited to be the new representative. Uh, by this point, he's 30 years old. He is in charge of all of the underground operations going in and out of Switzerland, of which there are many. And among other things, he participates in ransom negotiations with the Nazis. The Nazis are looking around the same landscape as everybody else, realizing that the Allies are likely going to win. And so some Nazis decide, well, maybe we can get something for the Jews if the US cares about the fate of the Jews. So McClelland and Sally Meyer, who is the Joints representative in Switzerland, managed to string along a group of high-ranking Nazis for seven months, um, claiming that the U.S. is interested in paying ransom uh, for Jews and that we will do it, we just need to cross a couple of T's and dot a couple of I's. Um, at the beginning of November 1944, McClelland even goes to Zurich to one of the hotels in the big banking district and has a personal meeting with SS Oberstrom von Fuhrer Kurt Becker, who works directly for Adolf Eichmann. And McClellan pretends that he is President Roosevelt's personal emissary, sent by the president um, to express his personal interest in the fate of the Jews. So during the war, um, a US government humanitarian aid operative meets with a high-ranking SS officer in uniform to discuss ransom for humanitarian purposes. And as a result of these meetings, um, McClellan and Sally Meyer get more than 600 or 16, 1600, sorry, more than 1600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis for carrying out this on. Beyond all of this, the War Refugee Board opens a refugee camp in upstate New York in Oswego. They bring about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there. Uh, this is the only group of refugees we bring outside of our immigration laws um, in anything akin to any sort of refugee or asylum. Uh, they are kept there for m more than a year, about a year and a half, behind barbed wire. So even though they are here, even though they are brought to America, they have come and they are forced to live behind barbed wire. But the US does this because they argue that we can't be hypocrites. We can't be asking other countries um, to take more refugees and then visibly not be willing to take our, our own. The U.S., um, the War Refugee Board, sends 300,000 packages, food packages, into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. So if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about getting a food package in a camp, it was almost certainly packed on Long Island, shipped across the ocean to Sweden, disguised as a Red Cross package, and delivered in the final weeks of the war to Dachau, where this photo was taken, to Mauthausen, to Ravensbrück, to Sachsenhausen, um, never with anybody understanding that this was paid for or created by the US government. Um, they pass on requests from the war department, or to the war department to bomb the gas chambers and the rail lines and the crematoria leading to Auschwitz. Um, that is rejected by the War Department, who says that would be a diversion of war resources, which is the one thing the War Refugee Board is told they can't do. Um, and so, in the fall of 1944, when the War Refugee Board receives this report, which is a report written by two escapees from Auschwitz, it's, they title it, German Extermination Camps Auschwitz and Birkenau. It's a very graphic report um, that gives names and dates and, and populations and very graphic details about the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz. The War Refugee Board sends this to the War Department and says, we think you need to bomb 
and the War Department writes back and says, no, it's still not a priority. And so the War Refugee Board gives this to the press. They send this out to 200 newspapers nationwide. It's front page news, Thanksgiving weekend, November 1944. Um, this is the Louisville Courier, which you can see has tried to cram the entire text onto a full length page for its readers. Um, and a week after this report comes out and, and is nationwide news, the Washington Post writes an editorial called Genocide. It's the first time this word is ever used in an American newspaper, and it's used with the argument that the War Refugee Board has just introduced Americans to a new crime and that we need to learn um, this word now. Th so, um, in conclusion, the War Refugee Board's creation was and remains really the only time we ever tried to do this. The only time the U.S. government creates a new agency and tasks it with trying to save the lives of the victims of our wartime enemy. Uh, in contrast to a lot of different subsequent human rights efforts, um, and, and efforts related to refugees. It's not about the Cold War. It's not about intelligence. The people that we're trying to help generally have no idea that the U.S. has any interest in their survival. Most still don't. Um, the refugees in peril are not intended to become American citizens. Most Americans still don't want more immigrants, um, even after the war. But the War Refugee Board, according to historian Yehuda Bauer, who is historian emeritus at Yad Vashem, he wrote, what made the War Refugee Board such a unique body is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. And so one of my goals with, with this talk, and I, I hope you'll help me with it, is for the War Refugee Board to start to enter our public narrative about the Holocaust. Um, because I think it is a really relevant story. A lot of what they're trying to do, um, decide between trying to provide relief for a lot of people or rescue a few. Um, bring refugees into a country when there are very real national security concerns. Debate how many resources we can risk falling into the hands of our enemies. These are things that we keep debating today, and sometimes we debate them as if it's the first time. And there are precedents we can go back to and people who are devoted to trying to save refugees and trying to help refugees with all of these things in their heads. And so I want to both honor their efforts because these were incredible men and women doing amazing things and dedicating themselves to trying to help um, Jewish refugees. It, it doesn't take back the many, many years in which the United States could and should have been doing much more. Um, but it does show that after a lot of activism, after a lot of pressure, there was an official government response and it was a response to try to help. And I think that is something that we can remember to honor them and to remember as we, we study what they did, um, as we can continue to confront similar challenges today. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes, 10 minutes for questions. If anybody has any, just um, raise your hand and I will repeat the question. Yes, sir, in the orange sweater. Yeah. Yeah, the question is what did what did Great Britain try to do? I think Great Britain does a much better job than we do in nineteen thirty eight, nineteen thirty nine with the Kinder transports. You know, we we talk about having our own transport of children. There's a bill proposed by Robert Wagner here in New York. Um, and Edith Rogers, a Republican from Massachusetts, so a Republican and a Democrat, bipartisan bill to bring 20,000 German refugee children to the U.S. in 1939 and 1940, and it doesn't even make it out of committee. There's, there's no movement on this. Most people don't think it, it will succeed. 67% um, of Americans want it to fail anyway. Um, so they do a much better job before the war begins for immigration, uh, but they really have to generally shut their doors in 1939 when they get involved in the war. We continue immigration for longer than that. Um, and then during the war, they seriously consider bombing for a while in 1944, but then decide that the Americans are in a better place to do it. And the Americans, of course, drop the ball on that. Um, they don't have anything akin to a war refugee board, though. Um, they, with their proximity to Europe, I think they see the war in a very different way than America does. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, two things I want to add up. Uh, first of all, uh, 
when I shipped from Germany, they said, no reason. Mm -hmm. Then to the shore of America, they turned them back, they sent them back to the death. That's one thing I want to mention. And second, there is a book called Very by the Times. Yes. In New York Times. Yeah. They knew very early about what's going on. Yeah. And they could change the whole situation. But that's what it says. They bury the news, let's say, in the 19 pages, in the 19 page, and the last two paragraphs in the bottom of the page. Yeah. They knew all about it, and they did everything not to let the public to know about it. Well, I can, yeah, I can address both of these. So, for, because they're both a little bit more complicated than the, than the kind of sound bites that I think a lot of us know about history. Um, the first thing is that the St. Louis is actually the only ship that's ever turned back from the United States. Um, between 1938 and 1941, there are about 111,000 self-identified Jewish refugees who come to the U.S. as immigrants. Um, the Holocaust Museum estimates that somewhere between 180 and 220,000 refugees, again, refugees coming as immigrants, um, find haven in the U.S., which is much less than 6 million. Uh, to be sure. The St. Louis is actually aiming at Cuba. The passengers don't have U.S. immigration visas, um, and so they're in, the, in line for immigration to the U.S., many of them, and they're planning to wait in safety in Cuba. Cuba turns them away because they had purchased their paperwork from a corrupt Cuban official who the State Department estimated had made a million dollars off Jewish um, refugees selling these false papers to them. Um, and so the Cuban government turns them away, the U.S. government does not does not accept them. They think that they're, they would be jumping the line. It would be setting a precedent where there are people waiting back in Germany who could come. Um, Canada, likewise, does not offer them asylum. Um, the joint gets involved and manages to negotiate with the governments of France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and no, the, just the three, um, to divvy up the passengers so that none of them have to go back to Nazi Germany. At the time, this is June 1939, that's considered a success. The passengers throw a party on board, they're thrilled that they won't have to go back to Europe or to Nazi Germany. Um, the, the joint even makes a fundraising video about what a great job they did, that they quickly scrap as soon as the Nazis invade Western Europe the next year, and some of the passengers are once again under um, Nazi occupation. No, I'm sorry. It was in Great Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. I gotta give them all credit. Um, they divvy up the passengers. Two thirds of the passengers, more than two thirds of the passengers, survived the war. Um, in terms of buried by the times, there are quite a lot of reports about what's going on. Most Americans are not reading the New York Times. I think there is a valid criticism of the Times for not highlighting this. I think they fall into the same trap that a lot of people do of saying this could potentially be propaganda. And if it's not going to be on page one, it's going to be on page 19 with the other foreign news that's unverified. We don't have reporters in Eastern Europe who are verifying what's happening. And so I think the Times acted with an abundance of caution that given the seriousness of the situation uh, was probably unwarranted. Um, but most Americans are not reading the New York Times. It depends on what their local paper decided to do. Some of them are trumpeting it. The Jewish press is obviously much more tuned in um, to what's going on. And so the Jewish community, especially the ones who could read the Yiddish newspapers, could read the foreword, um, they know right away what's happening and they know the whole time. And they can't get anybody to listen. Yes, in the half. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Auschwitz, Auschwitz Birkenau is really three main camps. There's Auschwitz I, which is um, the first camp that was created. It's, it's largely a forced labor camp for men. Birkenau was, was built a little bit later. That's where the gas chambers and the crematoria were located, and also a women's camp, a family camp. Um, the camp for Roma was located at Birkenau. And then there's Buna Monowitz, which is a few miles away, and that is another forced labor facility that, that is making synthetic rubber and synthetic oil for IG Farben. Um, and so 
there are three distinct parts of Auschwitz, but they're all together. So Auschwitz is both an extermination camp, a concentration camp, and a labor camp, um, all built into one, which is why so many people, in part, why so many people went through there. Yes, sir. Um, you're questioning the U.S. involvement in trying to get um, neutral, um, neutral countries and Jews. I was wondering how much um, U.S. efforts to prevent um, Jews from reaching Palestine got in the way specifically the, uh, the white everyone paper. knows about the St. Louis, yeah. but there's also the case of the Bruma, which yes. was a the ship, Struma. Yeah. The ship of uh, Romanian Jews that um, had permission to get to the Holy Land, but under British and American pressure, the Turkish uh, government uh, refused access to the Bosporus, and eventually someone actually sunk the ship. Yes. Um, how much um, efforts of the rest of people are trying to get new country to take Jews got in the way of State Department efforts warning yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a really to good question. Jews to get to the Holy Land? It's a really good question. Um, so, the U.S., for most of the war, is very hesitant to push the British on Palestine. Pal uh, the British control Palestine as part of the British mandate, the, what is now the State of Israel. Um, and so the Struma comes about when um, the, this group of, of Jews board, they get to Istanbul, they're not permitted to land in Turkey, they spend a month sitting off the shores in Istanbul, um, finally they're towed back out to sea and uh, without a motor, they're towed into the Black Sea and uh, sunk by a Soviet submarine. Um, that is December, I think it's December 1942. It could be 1941, I apologize for not remembering. Um, so the US uh, officially, of course, thinks Palestine is a really good idea. There are um, bills in Congress that are passed in the spring of 1944 while the War Refugee Board is, is getting up and running, um, specifically expressing that the U.S. thinks that this is a haven for Jews and wants to put pressure on the British to do it. Roosevelt is hesitant to put pressure on the British to open up Palestine, and officially the, um, the white paper is set to expire in March 1944, which was the date after which there, were, there was to be no Jewish emigration into Palestine anymore. Um, the War Refugee Board kind of gets around that. They convince uh, the government of Turkey to allow about 8,000 passengers to land uh, in Istanbul. They go by train across Syria and into Palestine. Um, so the War Refugee Board's representative in Turkey, along with the U.S. Dipl the US diplomatic corps in Turkey, are really instrumental in um, getting the British to agree to this and, and all of the diplomatic machinations that are involved in getting people across all of these areas, buying the boat, getting Romania and Bulgaria to let them out, getting the Turks to let them in, getting the French to let them go through Syria, getting the British to let them in, getting the Jewish agency to issue the papers. Um, it is a massive diplomatic effort. Um, not always successful, but in this case, they get about 8,000 out uh, in, this, in the summer and fall of 1944. There are more questions, but I think we're going to conclude the program. I will be out there signing books um, if anyone is interested uh, to pick one up. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Whenever a survivor wants to speak. Good evening, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I've got the mic. I've got a lot of stories here. You have to hold it there. I've heard a lot of stories here. I'm one of the survivors. I was born in Poland in Krakow, not far from Auschwitz. I was very lucky being able to escape from Poland. Got smuggled across two borders from Poland to Slovakia in 1943. I wound up in an orphanage in Hungary. We got there to Hungary before the Nazis occupied Hungary. We were also warning the Hungarian Jews to do something, run away, they wouldn't listen. 
I was liberated by the Russian army December 3rd, 1944. I see all the stuff. Till 94, nobody knew what was happening. In 1940, 41, everybody knew what was happening. After that, after liberation, most of the Jews that live in other countries like Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, were able to stay in their countries, go to their old homes. The Polish Jews were the most Jews before the war lived in Poland. Three and a half million Jews lived in Poland. I lived in the city of Krakow that had 80,000 Jews. After the war, when we were liberated in Hungary, I also survived because I lived on Christian papers. After the war, we went back to Poland searching for survivors. I come from a family from before the war, maybe 300 people, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins. We were the sole survivors as a family from all these people. We went back to Poland searching for survivors. While I was there, there was a pogrom where four Jews were killed in Krakow. We had to go into hiding after the war. I'm listening, you know, but they just couldn't hold it back. We were stateless. We couldn't go back to Poland to our home. We had to get smuggled into Western Germany in order to, hoping maybe we'd be able to go to Israel, maybe to America. Sorry. We were kept for three years in DP camps with no place where to go, we were stateless. Finally, after three years, we got a visa to come to America. Thank God I'm here, I have a family, I have beautiful kids, children, grandchildren, even great grandchildren. No, he found me. I don't know how. A few years ago, she asked me, would I speak? I didn't know if I could. But she got me to do it. <laughs> <coughs> and the whole thing opened up to me. The last two years, since I speak, I get more bitter. I keep remembering. My wife can verify I get dreams in the, in the night, nightmares. Why didn't they bomb the, the railroads to the gas chambers? saved so many people. Those people were indifferent. It was all politics. What do you do? I hope you all remember, never forget, Thank you. Thank you. I just spoke uh, this week at IS 48.
he spoke at a yeshiva on the Upper West Side. We were able to, through the Holocaust Center, pair him up with a pro project there that culminates in the spring. Um, and he spoke at many, many schools on Staten Island about um, his tragic family story. And Krakow um, was of particular interest to us because we stopped there on our trip from Berlin to Auschwitz. We stopped at Krakow. Krakow is the city featured in Steven Spielberg's film, Schindler's List. So having a survivor from Krakow is very important um, to the Holocaust Center. So thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, so I just, um, we have one more very brief um, talk before we go on. We're very honored um, that Councilman Joe Borelli, um, who has just returned from Auschwitz, um, was able to uh, make some time after teaching at CSI tonight uh, to come to Wagner as part of our ongoing CSI Wagner partnership for Holocaust uh, work, um, which this event represents. And um, as many of you know, Councilman Borelli is a big lover of history, um, all different parts of history, Staten Island history. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hear um, tonight, a few words about what it meant to walk in the footsteps of um, the one million Jews and others that were killed in Auschwitz. Thank you. Uh, thank you and, and good evening. I, uh, I know uh, that you guys have been here for a while, so I won't, won't be too long. Um, I just want to say that sometimes we see politicians going on junkets, and uh, oftentimes you uh, imagine them on sunny beaches and things like that. Um, I can tell you with confidence that a trip to Poland, uh, both to Warsaw to see the rebuilt uh, Warsaw Ghetto, uh, and a trip to Krakow to visit Auschwitz, is not one of those beach uh, and pina colada trips, as you could course imagine. Um, the reason why there are organizations willing to sponsor trips uh, for people like me to go to Auschwitz is because uh, in 2016 the City Council started the Holocaust Survivor Initiative in which the Council has decided to help pay for the living expenses uh, and day-to-day -day needs for uh, some of the Holocaust survivors who still reside in New York. <clears throat> Unfortunately, our money is limited to New York. Um, when we started it, there were about 45,000 Holocaust survivors living in New York City. Of course, there are less now. And the last uh, statistic I saw from the UJA was that there are 36,000 living in the New York metro area. Um, despite the fact that few remain, uh, the costs have actually gone up. As you all can ima imagine from dealing with your own lives and your own relatives, as people get older, the cost of care gets higher. Uh, so that is the purpose for why people are so willing to make sure that the memory of the Holocaust is vivid in the minds of the next generation of politicians. And vivid it is. Um, I'm, I'm actually proud to say that I went to Auschwitz. I mean, odd to say I'm proud to say that. But I am proud to say that I went to Auschwitz on my own uh, in 2015 because of my own uh, interest in history and my own interest in the Holocaust and my own desire to, to sort of confront uh, the, the problems of the past. And that's the way I would describe visiting Auschwitz for those of you who have not been there. It's a confrontation. Uh, it's a confrontation with, with logic. It's tough to process. And if a person who was born like I was in 1982, it's very difficult to imagine a system, as you pointed out, where no one spoke up, where no one in power put a stop to it. No one tried. People collaborated. It's tough to imagine that. And frankly, the, the work done by the uh, folks who run the facilities there, I mean, they do a tremendous job. They've kept the, the original Auschwitz camp preserved the way it would have looked if you were a prisoner. Uh, and that's difficult in one respect. And the gas chamber is difficult because it, has, it, it is as it was. Um, just down the road at the uh, Birkenau camp, it's left to the remnants as it would be, you know, as it was. And that's difficult in a different light because 
it's there you get an idea of the scale of the Holocaust. The main Auschwitz Canada, the original one, is not, it's not very large. It's, it's easy to imagine a lot of people there. Seeing Birkenau and seeing the rows and rows of foundations of bunkhouses that stretch as far as you can see, about a mile and a half in each direction, is a powerful statement uh, in and of itself. <clears throat> I also had the opportunity in, in my life to travel to, to Yad Vashem, and uh, for me that was actually more, more powerful. So for some reason everyone, everyone reacts to things differently and, and personally and, and uh, interestingly or however you want to describe it, uh, but the most emotional point of a visit to Yad Vashem is at the end, when if you go uh, with a guide or with you, whether you go with an audio guide, but you're confronted with the Holocaust and you follow a path and you see all the things you might imagine and they're all difficult uh, and, and, and tough to digest in their own right. But to conclude the museum, you're placed out on a balcony which overlooks a valley. I forget the name of it, I probably should look it up. But in the valley there's high speed rails and there's highways and there's hospitals and schools and you can hear the population, you can hear the people that live in this valley. And the guide talks about how this is the perseverance of the Jewish people. And the second part of our trip uh, in Poland was to also rediscover what Jewish life is today in a place where, I, I apologize for not getting your name, I, I came late, where you had trouble finding survivors. Um, now there seems to be a growing uh, Jewish population and an acceptance of Jewish life. We met both with the chief rabbi of Poland, who's in New York, and we met with the chief rabbi, well not the chief rabbi, but uh, one of the head rabbis of the JCC of Krakow, who's also a New Yorker, which is uh, it's great um, to, to just see that experience. But it's, it's a rewarding trip, and it's a powerful trip, and it really does cause anybody who experiences it uh, the, the need to reflect on how humanity could act in this way. Because it is too easy to forget. It's very easy to forget. It's very easy to forget the Holocaust survivors and dismiss them as any other person who's elderly uh, and uh, has a low income. Um, but it's these trips and these experiences that force us to confront the awful side of humanity that we thankfully don't see much of, uh, but we know that the potential for that uh, still exists, and the potential for it uh, is still uh, very real. So thank you for having me uh, speak. I'm sorry I couldn't be more entertaining. I just I actually get a little bit emotional when I think about it, so I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So tonight we journeyed from um, an eighth grader who spends his communion money to buy artifacts from the Lush Ghetto um, to one of our elected officials testifying to um, the importance of visiting Auschwitz and Yad Vashem, Arthur Spielsman's emotional appeal, and Rebecca's really brilliant talk, um, all together about the theme of not being indifferent, about how important it is to have empathy, to have ethical decision making, to pass this on. Um, to the next generation through education. And so I want to thank all of you for being part of this. I hope you will take this lesson um, and as Samantha Power said, live it every day in the decisions you make. Um, and then I also want to make, Amy and I both want to make an appeal um, to please be generous in giving a gift both to the support the activity tonight um, and also for the ongoing activity of the Holocaust Center. So um, please let us know on the envelope if there's a particular way you want it. Otherwise, the initial amount will be used to pay for tonight's events um, and then ongoing education efforts regarding Holocaust and collaborative efforts um, in the future. So please give generously and please continue to support the Holocaust education both at Wagner College um, and um, throughout your lives and the decisions you make. So thank you so much. Thank you, President Martin and Jan Martin, for your support um, and everybody who came tonight.
And, and also from Hello at the College of Staten Island, we thank all of you for being here tonight. It's an important night. Um, and when we hear of reports of swastikas being drawn on the uh, doors of apartments with mezuzahs in Manhattan, which happened just last week, it's more than just teenagers acting up and doing vandalism. The swastika means something serious and um, it's why we persist with these kinds of events. So thank you all for coming. And if, you pat, if your name is on the envelope, you will, there will be a drawing and you will hear from me whether or not you win those two free tickets to Steve Israel on March 15th at 10.30 a.m. So thanks again. I think there's still food outside. It's probably cold, but there's still food outside. And I, nice to see you all.